for, for joining us at the Emergency Environment environmental health forum uh, today is obviously the last day of the forum um, and we're looking forward to a slightly different format today uh, from what we've been hearing the rest of the week um, so today is really designed to be an opportunity for learning and sharing around humanitarian wash research um, and strengthening operational learning as well so we felt that this was an important add-on to the rest of the Emergency Environmental Health Forum because in recent years, um, as you uh, are probably all aware, there's this growing focus on humanitarian response being evidence-based. So if we could go to the first slide, please. And as you're aware, in recent years, we've also seen um, an increase in humanitarian uh, funding for WASH related research, um, which has, of course, supported many of the projects that you've been hearing about over the last few days. But as um, many of our speakers have alluded to, research in crises is complex and hard to undertake with quality. So sometimes this is to do with factors outside of our control, um, things like the dynamics of the, the crisis itself. However, there's also often mitigation measures that can be put in place to minimize the risk of research going awry. And I think um, our partners who are supporting uh, this particular session today, ELRA, are quite familiar with, with a range of, of kind of limitations that they typically see in WASH related research proposals and um, have some ideas for how that could be strengthened. Also, even though we have seen a burgeoning of research on humanitarian WASH recently, uh, these projects are often quite small scale within organizations. And so research skills are often not transferred over to other projects to strengthen ongoing monitoring and evaluation, which could provide vital learning in crises uh, on other ongoing organizational activities. So this kind of seems to be a missed opportunity. And so these factors together kind of provide the rationale for why we wanted to have this learning and sharing workshop at the end of the EHF. So if you could go to the next slide, please. So today's workshop is going to be broken down into three sessions. Um, we're going to be starting off this morning uh, by brainstorming some of the barriers to conducting high quality research in humanitarian settings. And for this session, we're going to be hearing both from the perspectives of humanitarians, but also um, from the perspectives of donors. Uh, in session two, we have an exciting of a uh, series of presentations on um, some examples of research on WASH in humanitarian crises. But rather um, than you know the format that we've perhaps been seeing across the EHF so far, where it's been focused on sort of findings and insights for, for programmatic action, today we're going to be focusing on study designs. And we're going to try and be using these case studies to extract transferable lessons that could influence your future work and research design. In session three, we're going to pivot towards practical solutions for, th for strengthening research pro proposals uh, and, of course, implementation as well. And again, we're going to be doing this by thinking about humanitarian organizations and what they can do, as well as how donors might need to change and modify their systems of, of proposals. Um, and of course, we want today's session to be as interactive as possible with all of you. Um, so we will be asking you to write comments in the chat throughout. We'll also be running several Slido polls uh, at several points throughout the morning. We also want this to be a, a, a kind of frank and open discussion. Um, so I know to speak from my own experience, I've been working on research in crises for several years now, and I could really spend all day talking about the mistakes that I've made um, and, and things that have gone awry and things that seem so obvious in hindsight. And so that's the kind of um, the, the sense behind this session that we want to create. Um, and so I, I hope that some of you are familiar with uh, the Nakuru Accord. Um, basically, the Nakuru Accord focuses on encouraging WASH actors to fail better by talking more about mistakes and aspects of our work that didn't go so well. And so um, for more on the Nakuru Accord, um, I think Lauren has just posted the link in the chat there. Um, but we really want to encourage um, that essence of, of reflection within this session today. So uh, without further ado, um, let's jump into our first session. If you could go to the next slide, please. Thanks very much. 
Um, so in preparing for this session, I reached out to uh, my own network of, of uh, people working within humanitarian organizations and academics and donors. Um, and I asked them about what they're finding are some of the challenges in relation to doing um, uh, research well in humanitarian crises. And I should stress that these were just informal emails and discussions, um, and these perspectives certainly don't reflect any kind of comprehensive research that has been done. However, I did find the, the perspectives that were shared really insightful, and I think they resonated with my own experience of what is challenging about doing research in crises. So I've grouped these insights around some common themes today, and these will include uh, the following, uh, effective partnerships, deciding what and where to research, ethical challenges, methodological challenges, sharing findings, time and resource constraints, capacity strengthening, and strengthening operational learning, that is sort of strengthening the way that we do monitoring and evaluation. And so what I plan to do over the subsequent slides is basically just talk through some of the insights that were shared in relation to each of these. And as I do so, it would be really great if you could add your reflections in the chat in relation to each of these themes um, and anything else perhaps that you're finding is particularly challenging. Um, and um, as we go through, we'll then come back to these uh, comments and chats at the end, um, and we'll get uh, Lauren to share some of your perspectives and, and summarize what's been, been written. So if we could jump into the first slide, please. So um, our first theme here is around effective partnerships. Um, so there were points here about setting up partnerships between academics and humanitarian organizations in advance of crises. So we see here the first quote says, we need MOUs and agreements in place with academia so that when crises happen, they are ready to provide support in, in terms of designing questionnaires and rapid assessments and evaluation and also supporting on data analysis. Others highlighted that there are sometimes unequitable power dynamics in forming the partnership development. So one person explained that research skills are not a common skill set in the humanitarian sector. And there are definitely some people who have the capacity, and it's probably why we see the same NGOs engaging in research. We also see that some NGOs have a more structured institutional relationship with the university or research institutions, which contributes to them being able to do research in crises. And, and lastly, a point that humanitarian organizations themselves could be better at coordinating research activities. So we, here we see someone say that coordination between different humanitarian actors on research and learning is key. Next slide, please. And again, as we're going through these, if you have points to add on, on what, what the barriers are to uh, effective partnerships, please do add those in the chat. So the next theme here is, is deciding what and where to research. And I think this theme is quite key in terms of proposal development, as it requires us to get better at articulating our research questions. Um, so you can see that here in, in the first quote, uh, a lot of WASH research proposals suffer from poorly articulated hypotheses and evidence thresholds. Another person says we need to spend more time and attention to formulating a robust research question and subsequent project design. Too often priorities are defined in terms of broad technical gaps rather than problems to be solved or specific research questions. Another person also mentioned research questions or research topics often get chosen by headquarters or are prioritized by donors and don't necessarily reflect the priorities that are coming from country teams. I think we also have um, some insights here on um, where we do research. Um, so for example, we have a quote that, um, what I noticed is that we often do research in long-term refugee camps, uh, but not in other types of crisis affected settings. So there is a risk that the learnings in these settings are not particularly generalizable. Um, also some insights on how we prioritize research topics. Um, so a quote at the top uh, right hand corner, research is often focused on innovations rather than your run of the mill regular old wash program. So we don't necessarily build a body of learning around what NGOs are doing every day because the research is focused on new products or approaches that may or may not have um, enough uptake afterwards. 
And then lastly, I think um, this, this last quote reflects on what we can reasonably expect research to do within the, within the sector and what it will lead to. Um, so this person mentions that WASH suffers from the pressure of suggestion that all research should lead to scale. We need to be cautious about this vision of bringing to scale all the time, as it should be researched to develop a menu of options and local solutions. So some really interesting perspectives there about refining um, what we are researching and where we are doing that research. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here we come to the theme around ethical challenges, uh, where we had a range of insights which were raised, uh, including the fact that ethical uh, pr approval processes are often unfamiliar to humanitarian actors. So this first quote here um, says that a lack of experience, context and know-how uh, of humanitarian actors actors to prepare for and submit ethical approval boards. It's not something we do often, so trying to turn this around quickly isn't often realistic in timeframes we have. Uh, and building on this, I think um, there's also some reflections here about um, ethical approval boards often being poorly suited to the types of operational research that humanitarians typically conduct. Um, so we have a quote um, uh, that um, many humanitarian or humanitarian research doesn't always neatly fall into the different categories for institutional ethics approval, um, such as um, some approval boards are quite specific to medical research and don't understand or approve or even see the need for more social science based research. Also, just some reflections that um, timelines for approvals from ethic boards uh, often make uh, make researching crises very, very complex. Uh, so we have a quote here uh, that timeframes and fundings of ethics processes, often they don't align. Short humanitarian funding deadlines, but ethics processes that can take several months. And then uh, lastly, I think, you know, just in recognition that ethics is obviously much broader than just seeking that formal approval. So this last quote speaks to the practical ethical dilemmas in crises, and that is that in many situations, there are strong ethical issues associated with research and m and &E, providing some people and not others something that you have theoretical knowledge will help in a given situation is problematic, both if it works and if it doesn't. And I think there's probably a lot more around that. So it would be interesting to get your, your views and reflections on some of those operational ethical challenges. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So this slide is, is interesting. We, we actually had um, you know, more alignment, I think, uh, across the people I spoke with. Um, so most of these insights here are related to um, the research methodologies and how these are often derailed or delayed due to the nature of crises. Uh, so for example, one person said, uh, frequent disruptions to field access make it hard to stick with ME or research plans. Uh, another person said, we've often found that our initial research plans have been compromised because the emergency situation has changed halfway through the project and this affects the quality of our results. And lastly, we have someone saying that the compromises we make to data collection methodologies due to the nature of crises and what is feasible make it harder to generate good quality data. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Great, so we have quite a lot of um, insights here in relation to the sharing of, of findings and research learnings. Um, so there are points here about sort of sharing failures, which is great to see. So we had someone say that we need to embrace failure as well as success, learning by doing and failing is no bad thing. Um, there were also concerns about the ability for research findings to rapidly influence sort of practice and policy, perhaps recognizing that the circumstances of individual crises are often quite unique and that sometimes prevents transferability of research. Um, so uh, one person says there's a risk of data becoming obsolete given the fluidity of the situation which impacts research analysis and the related results. And another person mentions that it's uh, one problem is facilitating real time real, real time learning. If we wait until the end of the project to get findings, we will have missed opportunities to improve. Um, and then I think we also see um, some reflections here about um, how we need to rethink the way that we do dissemination of research findings. 
So uh, we have one person saying that, I think a lot of the challenges lie in communicating research findings in practical ways to uh, bring about the changes at the implementation level. Findings tend to be shared at head office level, but less so with field staff and with communities themselves, which means they're not impacting programs as fully as they could. And then we have um, a, a quote that says, it, it's really difficult sometimes to know how to frame a story about your data in a way that actually informs programming, particularly quantitative data. Numbers alone can't tell us what we need to do with our programming. And, and I think this is supported by the last quote where someone says, often teams provide us a list of what they have done, uh, but are unable to present coherently the so what. Uh, what was the outcome and next steps? Related to this, we need to help people on communication and graphic design uh, to tell the compelling story and learning. So quite a few points around, and around finding the right story. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, our next theme is around time and resource constraints in relation to research. Um, so uh, we have a few barriers being flagged here in relation to the fact that in many ways research and humanitarian work often um, just don't work to the same timeline. So uh, one person says that humanitarian organizations struggle to do anything but life essential, life essential work and therefore there are limitations on performing tests, trials or even intensive monitoring in these settings. Another person mentioned that humanitarians are often totally overloaded with work and not able or willing to attend the extra workload associated with research and m and and, and I think uh, the last quote kind of backs this up, that really we need to recognize that good research often and, and normally takes years. Uh, we also have recognition here that there um, is often underfunding for certain phases of research, perhaps due to a lack of understanding of what these phases really involve, um, and also a lack of investment in monitoring and evaluation generally. So we have one person saying, research is a process that proceeds by different stages, each with a different objective, requiring different ways of working and different sets of skills to manage effectively. Proactively, we need to recognize this more from the outside, outset and resource well. Little financial investment in M&E and research. This is evident even in large international NGOs with huge portfolios and there is minimal budget for individual projects. Um, and then lastly, I think uh, we have one person uh, just mentioning that the scale of a lot of research grants and the nature of their design often make them quite unappealing to actually undertake for country teams. So this person mentions that there is some resistance by country teams to take up research proposals as they do not yield large budgets and there are always strict restrictions on what, what, cover, what costs are eligible, for example, admin costs and overhead costs. And research funding often only covers research costs and not program activities. And linking these things up is really hard. So moving on then to the next slide on capacity strengthening, if we could. Um, so uh, on this slide, um, in terms of capacity, one of the challenges seems to be retaining research skills within organizations. Um, so this person mentions that um, we found it hard to institutionalize research within our organizations. Research assistants are often hired for a specific project, but then that project finishes and it's hard to retain those skills. Um, and uh, another person mentions we grapple with being equipped with the right skills to synthesize results, findings, discussions, conclusions, and research and learning. Other people mention the need to strengthen capacity around mental health protection uh, and problem solving. So one person mentions uh, training needs to include mental health and protection impacts of, of, of adverse events on research staff and populations. And similarly, someone highlights that in highly volatile contexts, staff should be trained in problem solving in relation to managing the impact of security issues on data collection. Um, and then the last quote really just kind of backs up this point about, um, about those skills not being retained within organizations. So the turnover in, in humanitarian crises of staff means that lessons are learned, but then those people move on from the program context and someone new comes in and so learning isn't often applied. 
Um, so let's move uh, to our last of the uh, themes, which is around uh, strengthening operational learning. And so my rationale for including this here is really summed up uh, by this first quote here, um, which is that we need to start using research experience to strengthen ongoing M&E approaches. Others recognize that ME soft systems are kind of not always fit for purpose for learning and are more designed based on providing accountability to donors. Um, so this person says there's a culture to simply deliver on indicators, checking the boxes of what a specific donor needs. Uh, staff rarely interrogate the impact of a program for future responses or continuity. Um, and another person mentions that monitoring systems are often designed to fulfill donor reporting requirements and aren't broad enough or dynamic enough to capture learning about discrete interventions. Similarly, evaluations often focus on a whole program, which can sometimes mask the specific learning that might be needed on a certain intervention. Um, and then um, we lastly had some quotes which kind of identified opportunities for strengthening op operational learning. So one was around uh, trying to use more standardized indicators. Um, so I think we need to do more to build capacity around common frameworks and standardized tools to help people realize the value of comparable data and, and at the same time need to support and contextualize and translate these tools so that they are meaningful in context. Um, similarly, we have one more quote, which is the need for systematized real-time evaluation and documenting the learning during crises as a default approach to generating evidence-based learning. So that's where I'm going to sort of wrap up in terms of presenting these themes, but I'm aware there's been lots of activity coming in through the chat. Um, so um, I want to perhaps uh, hand the microphone over to Lauren and she's going to perhaps highlight some of the, the agreement with these points and also perhaps areas where in your uh, chat you are identifying new areas or differences, um, different barriers that are emerging. Over to you, Lauren. Thanks, Sean, and thanks everybody for adding such such valuable contributions to the chat. And I can see they're still coming in. Um, so just, I think we've had a lot of uh, people echoing the sentiments that Sean's made throughout her presentation. Uh, a couple of comments here from on partnerships, particularly from Kit and Jenny. Kit saying on partnerships, she wonders if there's something about the culture of an organisation related to learning and research. Um, Jenny kind of similarly saying there needs to be maybe more strategic emphasis on mapping of local researchers in country to support the different challenges or research questions in humanitarian responses, uh, rather than, you know, going with who you know and um, all of the time. Uh, other things, again, uh, similarly, for on methodologies, uh, Brian made a really good point that methodologies are not necessarily delayed, but they may not be suitable for context. And maybe this is something we'll come to again in session two and three later on. Um, we had lots of comments on sharing findings. I think a lot of you are finding this issue across uh, your organizations and across research within this sector, um, particularly on sharing failure. Uh, both Brian, Kit and Jeff all mention that, you know, we're not sharing failure, uh, what to do with failure when it occurs, and some of that's not excusable. Um, one thing Kit said, one thing we don't do in pilots or research is define what is failure. You know, really important if we're not defining it for uh, our organisations and for ourselves, then how can we talk about it and share those findings? Um, oh, and a great comment here from Anne, similarly on sharing findings, that Elrus funded a number of studies recently which support this quotation that research findings uh, or learning really rarely gets down to a country or community level, um, and it's not presented in perhaps user-friendly or digestible formats. I know from some of our work, it's not even presented in the language of the country um, where the research has occurred in, so that, you know, these, these barriers that can um, be overcome that we can do better. Uh, a few things on operational learning, uh, just coming to an earlier comment from um, from from both from, oh, from, here we go, Brian, analysis is weak, perhaps data is definitely collected, but cannot necessarily be used, and I think that's something we see across uh, many of these organisations. And then I'm going to come to a last couple of comments that we have in the chat here from Chloe and Kit, talking about high turnover of staff. You know, we have compartmentalized organizations, you know, lessons learned equals lessons lost um, is really important in many contexts from Chloe. 
She's talking an example from Public Health England. There was a formalising of lessons learned by filling out a form at the end of a project and circulating it within the organisation. So I'm not sure if that exists elsewhere, but something to think about or keep talking about the high turnover of staff as well and their capacity and the research capacity or the m and &E capacity within organisations. Where do these people go? Something about how the longevity of, of these research cycles or m and &E cycles and how to keep that within the system. So yeah, I think some really great points that are resonating with a lot of the quotations that Sean shared um, throughout this session. And we can see that, you know, from different organisations here that you're all representing, the commonality as well with some of these situations that we're having. Um, I will just quote, go to the chat, but Sean, back to you, and I'll see if there's any more in the chat. Great, thanks so much, Lauren. That was a really nice uh, synthesis. So um, maybe if we could um, bring up the slides again, please. Um, so we just want to wrap up this first part of the session um, by getting you all to log on to Slido. Um, so uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with Slido, um, all you need to do is type into your web browser sli.do, um, and the uh, the code to be using is hashtag eehf. Um, there you can see it uh, coming up on the screen. Um, and that should bring up a question um, where we basically listed out each one of the themes that we discussed this morning in, and, and highlighted insights around. And what we would like you to do is priority, prioritize these themes um, and try and identify which of these do you think um, creates the biggest barrier to research in crises. Now, we're, we're aware that this is a little bit of a crude question, but we do hope that kind of doing this prioritization exercise um, will allow us to kind of know where we should be prioritizing our efforts. So we'll give you all just a few moments to complete uh, that on Slido. I do see like some more comments coming in in the chat, which are, are really interesting. I, I think Michelle's raised a point about uh, planning and, and uh, thinking about the, these learning challenges and research challenges early on in, in grant agreements, which uh, seems like a nice example from their incontinence research. Um, we do, I see, have some results that are coming in uh, from Slido, which is great to see. So. I mean, I must admit that the, the one at the top there are time and resource constraints. I must admit that that probably doesn't come as a surprise to myself or, or to most of you. Um, I think that that is a real challenge with most of the research work that we're undertaking. Um, it's interesting that, that methodological challenges are also rate, rating quite high. Um, it would be interesting perhaps if there were additional methodological challenges um, that we didn't flag in the insights that you wanted to, to discuss here. Um, but I presume that that most of this does relate to the fact that the methods we plan often can't then be carried out because of the changing nature of crises. Um, but also quite a lot of votes coming in for um, sort of really refining those research questions around um, what and where to research, uh, some around capacity strengthening, uh, which is, is, is good to see because it's hopefully something that, that is relatively easy to invest in and strengthen, um, and, and doing operational learning a little bit better, um, and some votes also for sharing uh, research, but but it does seem like we have a clear dominating uh, area to, to prioritize, which is in terms of, 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 of staff uh, time and funding of, of research. So um, let me wrap up there. We're now going to be handing over um, to James Smith from ELRA, who's going to be telling us a little bit about the challenges that they've observed in some of the WASH related research proposals that are coming into them as a donor. So over to you, James. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, and really great to be with you all today. Um, thank you uh, to those who've organized and also thank you to, to you participants who've, who've, who've stayed with us after a week of, of um, discussions already. Uh, my name is James Smith. Um, I'm here today representing ELRA, specifically the uh, Research for Health in Humanitarian Crises program, where I work as, as uh, our humanitarian health research advisor. So Sean's very uh, helpfully already sort of outlined some of the multitude of challenges that 
we face trying to conduct research in humanitarian contexts. Um, I'm glad that we've already sort of started to touch on some of the possible solutions uh, alongside some of the many gaps and, and impediments. Um, and clearly there are some things that are, um, can I say, sort of cultural shifts that need to need to occur, but also there are some sectoral and subsectoral, some, sorry, subsectoral uh, changes that, that, that I'd like us to discuss uh, in a little bit more detail um, with the remainder of, of this workshop. Over the next 15 minutes or so, um, I'm really going to, to to offer a sort of top line overview of some of the pitfalls that we typically see in in WASH uh, proposals and and humanitarian um, research proposals more broadly um, from our perspective as as the R2HC. Uh, and I'd just like to give a quick thanks to 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 my colleague Anne Harmer and others who've really helped to feed into uh, some of what we're going to be discussing um, here. Uh, if I can move on to the next slide, please. I mentioned this just to sort of situate feedback that I'm I, I'm, I'm summarising in the in the following slides. Um, we as the R2HC have a couple of specific kind of review criteria, um, and I'm aware that other donors, of course, uh, use different criteria to measure um, the, the 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 fundability of um, research proposals. So, so the feedback I'm I'm I'm, I'm discussing with you um, in the coming slides is really organised around these five um, key criteria. Impact is one that, of course, we'll see across uh, donor uh, donor organisations, but this is central to our uh, uh, raison d'etre, if you like, um, that we really want to see research proposals that um, have established a very clear plan and a very clear ambition to improve outcomes for people affected by humanitarian crises. Methodology is of course a really um, a really big issue and I'll discuss a bit more about that in a moment, but uh, clarity of, of methods is, is, um, is central to a strong research proposal. Feasibility is another big one, so um, we, we can see on sort of both ends of the spectrum, sometimes studies that perhaps aren't ambitious enough, but often studies that are far too ambitious given the, the, the time frame and given the budget. That obviously relates in some respects to value for money. Um, does the does the budget really uh, align with the impact that you're trying to achieve? And then partnerships, as Sean's already discussed, and as some of you have already mentioned in the chat, really, again, central to uh, a strong research proposal. Uh, for ELRA and, and R2HC, um, we look specifically for partnerships between research or, or academic institutions, um, operational organizations, uh, and very importantly, uh, that at least one um, institution must be based in the country or region in which the research uh, is being conducted. So with that, if we could move on to the next slide, please. So this question of impact. Um, so the, the 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 sort of the bullet points here and, and in the next couple of slides are really, uh, as I say, some of the pitfalls that we see um, regularly in in wash proposals. Uh, I must say that that the the number and the quality of proposals has increased with time um, across the humanitarian health research space, um, and there is a real appetite to be funding more wash research. So we share this feedback. Um, not at all to be hypercritical, but really to sort of encourage, um, um, you know, stronger research proposals moving forward, which of course we would we would love to fund. So, one of the major issues from the get go is that often research studies aren't well justified. Um, the rationale is not clear. Um, there isn't perhaps uh, a deep dive into the existing evidence, even if it is sparse, to really situate your research proposal within the, the the wider context, within the wider existing evidence and, and knowledge base. Um, and that can be a real hindrance, not only to getting a, your study funded, but actually really trying to identify exactly where you can add value with the work that you're trying to do. Another major issue is what I've referred to in shorthand here, the sort of humanitarian specificity, which is to say that um, there's often not a clear justification as to why the research needs to be conducted in a humanitarian context as opposed to somewhere else. Um, now, humanitarian contexts, as we've discussed in detail already, 
often pose a multitude of, of um, challenges in terms of delivering research. So the justification for why the research needs to be done in this particular context, given often the dynamism and the instability, uh, needs to be very clear. Um, and if the justification is there, it's always good to draw from the evidence base from um, comparable non-crisis affected contexts um, to justify why um, that existing evidence base is not relevant to the question that you're asking. Uh, very important that the, the, the anticipated impact in terms of outcomes for people and for communities is, is clearly stated. Now, these can be health, behavioral, or, or other outcomes, depending on the study. Um, but often these can be the, 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 the outcome measures, um, or, or the outcome, sorry, that you're, that you're hoping to achieve um, is, is often quite vaguely um, sort of hypothesized. And very importantly, again, dissemination. So we've touched a little bit on this on the discussion that's 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 um, that's kicked off in the chat. But impact is not achieved with the end of a research project or with peer-reviewed publication, but with feedback of 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 findings to affected communities, to key stakeholders, and, and to those organisations uh, that that are working in the context in which you've conducted your research. So it's very important that you've outlined from inception through to dissemination uh, what you're planning to do at each stage in order to maximize impact uh, of the research once you've once you've finished. Uh, with that if we could move to the next slide please. So a couple of reflections on methodology. Um, the first uh, is is the level of detail in the methods um, and I'm going to touch a little bit more on this when I talk about partnerships in a moment but uh, methodology is often where we see uh, less detail and that might reflect um, that might reflect uh, a degree of uncertainty or discomfort with with identifying the most appropriate methodology it might reflect that within your initial research team you don't um, have for example a qualitative research expert um, on board so the the the, the methods in in uh, you, you know certain um, certain methodological choices might not be well justified and well detailed um, so the more detail the better uh, and to really justify why a particular method has been chosen over another is 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 very helpful. As I've mentioned already in relation to impact, um, clarity of outcome measures and of your overarching research objectives is is incredibly important. Um, with a poorly crafted objective, things can really um, become a little bit more complicated and of course it, it, it's incredibly helpful for you as researchers to clarify at inception what your overarching objective is in order that um, the, the, the research sort of project falls, falls firmly into place. Methods and objectives and outcomes are often not well um, aligned with one another. So if your outcome measures are clear, for example, you want to look at uh, barriers to uptake to a service, um, but you've chosen a methodology that perhaps doesn't engage um, uh, qualitative methods um, or, or, a, or a mixed methodology that would perhaps be more appropriate to the research question, um, then again, that's, that's where um, certain studies are going to be um, uh, deprioritized for funding. One of the big issues we've seen with with um, wash proposal, sorry, wash proposal methods, um, are issues around identification of comparison groups, um, control groups, uh, particularly if um, the, the the control or the comparison group is a is a no treatment group, uh, and this reflects broader ethical issues in the conduct of humanitarian um, research, but um, some very difficult questions to be asked and to be explored in a research proposal in relation to why one group is being given one treatment uh, or, or one form of intervention or perhaps um, no treatment or, or no intervention. Sampling can also be a challenge um, and here I refer to sampling not only in terms of how your sampling um, strategy is, is, is calculated and, and, and described, um, but, but also recognizing here some of the contextual challenges related to 
sampling, um, particularly in dynamic populations where um, you, you might not be working in a context in which um, houses are sort of uh, well kind of regimented and, and well organized. So a, a, a deeper exploration of how uh, sampling issues are, are to be addressed is, is particularly uh, helpful. And as I've mentioned already, mixed methods is um, mixed methods proposals. We're seeing gradually more uh, mixed methods proposals coming through. They have many advantages. Um, not only the sort of triangulation of different knowledge sources, different sources of evidence, um, but they also have real benefit um, in contexts in which it might be difficult, for example, to um, organize a large scale. In um, large-scale sort of experimental study. Mixed methods also help with some of the implementation questions uh, and some of the questions related to sort of contextualization and how to ensure that an intervention is actually going to achieve its hypothesized effectiveness in, in one context or, or another. Uh, next slide, please. So a couple of reflections on feasibility, and then I'll chat a bit about partnerships, and then I'm very keen to hear from, from you all uh, some of your own reflections on, on uh, feedback you've, you've received from, from donors when you've submitted research proposals. So feasibility is a really important one. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, we, we, we often see perhaps overly, overly ambitious studies, uh, and sometimes uh, studies that, that have real potential but, but haven't quite tapped into um, their full potential. Duration is often uh, a challenge and, and here we see, I think, research groups or research consortia trying to do too much uh, in the time that's afforded to them. There's certainly from, from uh, amongst researchers who perhaps aren't as um, and as familiar with, with conducting large-scale research projects. Um, there's a real ambition to do a lot, which is great. Um, but when you factor in, as I've mentioned here on the slide, uh, important elements such as local or regional ethics review, um, the time taken often to um, identify uh, additional partners in the local context, um, and then, of course, when you factor in the, the the dynamism of the context that you're working in and the potential for uh, necessary changes to the approach or delays to the rollout of your research, the time taken to actually deliver on on what you've you've said you you will um, can can stretch out further and further and further. So these things all need to be really carefully um, outlined in your in your anticipated uh, work plan. Scale of activities uh, again is 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 a major issue. So we often see sort of really ambitious proposals, uh, multi-country or multi-region studies, which um, certainly lend themselves towards generalizability, which is again something that we're keen to explore, um, but can often be so large and so complex that that they become almost um, impossible to to deliver. Um, a bigger, sort of more complex, more uh, uh, multi-country study isn't necessarily one um, that is going to achieve um, the, the the greatest impact. And and a more specific, uh, a more um, locally kind of confined study may well have the same sort of potential to achieve impact and indeed potentially generalizability depending on the way that the study is is uh, the way that the methodology and is organised. Contextualization I've referred to already here. So really having a good understanding of the context in which you want to deliver the research um, is, is really important at inception. So not only some of the more practical uh, elements related to actually delivering the research itself, such as how long it will take to get ethics review, who to actually approach for ethics review, but also a really good understanding of what's happening in the area in which you're working. And and, and again, this this I'm going to touch on when we speak about partnerships, but really requires that um, you already have a well-established presence in a context, you already have good connections with local stakeholders and local collaborators. There may well be major issues uh, in the near future, such as uh, an election or another anticipated political shift that you need to factor into the research process um, at, at inception. 
If we can move on now to my final slide on partnerships. So I said at the beginning, this, this is a really key element for us R2HC, but indeed for many donors um, across the sector. Uh, partnerships are, are, and a good partnership is really central to a strong research proposal and central to a successful research project, implementing a successful project. It's really important that partnerships reflect local expertise and therefore the local context. This is something that, as I say, we've built in as one of the uh, eligibility criteria for R2HC funding and other funders are, are doing much the same. Um, by partnerships here, certainly by local partnerships, we really mean genuine um, genuine partnerships with local collaborators so not your kind of tokenistic um, we've identified this research group and we've asked them to join us at the last minute but actually um, a, a research design process that engages local organizations and importantly local communities um, ideally at inception to to develop and then lead and, and ideally co-own the research and, and knowledge production process beyond sort of local and international um, partners. Uh, uh, another really important consideration is the skill set within the team. As I mentioned in relation to methodology, um, where we do see some methodological weaknesses, that that can uh, correlate with um, research teams that maybe don't have that. Uh, disciplinary or skill set expertise already built into the team uh, and it's important to identify that early on early on and bring in uh, additional expertise as needed whether that's a political scientist an anthropologist um, a statistician um, someone else to really bolster the the, the, the the kind of the multidisciplinarity of the team and as I've mentioned already in relation to impact um, good to really think about uptake and dissemination. Um, what skills, what expertise, uh, what partners do you need within your team to achieve um, uh, not only dissemination but then uptake of your research uh, towards the end of your of your of your research project? Uh, and again, this is perhaps reference here to the sort of the, the culture shift that needs to take place. But those skills, um, the, the, the skills needed to achieve uptake, to engage and, and lobby policymakers and other actors are often not embedded within research institutions and may not be the first priority um, of, of operational organizations. So something very important to consider um, at, at, at the partnership development stage. With that, um, I think I'll take a breath. Um, Lauren, I don't know if you're with us. I haven't been able to monitor the chat as I've been talking, but if there are any further reflections or questions from your side, I'd be interested to hear them. And then I think we've got a Slido for, for uh, participants to, to share some of their own experiences. Uh, yeah, James, oh, I'll, I'll jump in. We've been kind of looking at the chat together. There have been some um, additional comments coming through. Um, a lot, particularly uh, of people kind of uh, basically agreeing with your point around mixed methods uh, research and perhaps this being undervalued, particularly within the public health sector in comparison to other sectors. Um, and uh, I just see some comments, uh, additional comments coming through uh, from, from Jenny, for example, around hearing people's thoughts on, on budget allocation around research, uh, given the current funding climate. Um, uh, but, but generally, I think quite a lot of consensus and building upon the previous um, discussion as well. Um, I do want to um, uh, just quickly allow time for us to um, ask one question to all of our participants, again, via Slido. So I'd like if we could um, put the screen um, back up and, and uh, move to our next Slido. So again, use that same um, logon code, um, hashtag EHF. Um, and this time we're keen to know in your experience, and, and I suppose we're thinking here of your work with, with other donors um, uh, that, that you may have received uh, feedback on your proposals. And we'd like, if possible, for you to share some of those, those common challenges that you've encountered with your proposal writing.
So as uh, we're waiting for responses to come in via the Slido, I do see a couple of more points coming in uh, on the chat um, around, uh, Brian's raising a point around dissemination um, and that individual uh, sort of project attempts for dissemination might not be best practice when we could think about sharing uh, sort of findings together. Uh, a point from Anhama, um, that ELRA also looks for research teams that include um, a, a specific focus on, on research uptake and, and a focal point for this role, uh, sort of recognizing that this is a particularly important part of research. Um, and Kit just mentions that um, it would be kind of nice to see um, some of the successes reach research that has gone on to make a real difference uh, in programming across the sector. Um, and, and in our next session, I think we will be getting towards that kit, um, not necessarily uh, holding these examples up as, as the best examples, but I think really diving down into what makes uh, for strong methodologies in crisis settings and what are the kind of top tips. So uh, we'll be very much leading into that. Um, so uh, going back to our slider, I can't yet see results. Um, ah, here we go, we've got some coming in. Um, so uh, we've got a feedback on the proposal being too general but lacking detail um, and uh, that often reviewers actually already know quite a lot about what we're writing about so we don't need to um, go over some of the basics. Uh, things about being too optimistic about timelines, uh, which I think that definitely resonates with, with me. Um, problem statements not being very well articulated, um, uh, strengthening sort of m and &E plans, um, and that academic expenses are often too, ex too much uh, within the grant. Um, I think there's uh, another person mentioned there's a strong push towards uh, demonstrating health impact, which requires very large and expensive data collection, even for interventions we have um, known have a positive public health impact for a century, and we're trying to figure out how to do it better in our context. Uh, so I, I can definitely agree for this, you know, we often see this argument being made in relation to something like hand washing with soap, where we have the, the link between the behavior and the health impact known, but what we need to often focus on in crises is how do we make sure to increase the actual behavior. Um, any other um, insights that you have based on previous um, research proposals that you've submitted? Um, and I, I actually think this, this point is really on point, the fact that sometimes we get proposals coming in that are perhaps opportunistic and don't really respond to the nature of the research call. That's a good point. Just give us a couple of more uh, moments uh, in case there's any other reflections um, to add here. The, there was a question to Elra that I wonder, James, if, if you were able to perhaps speak to. Um, Kit was just asking in the chat, what kind of profiles the research uptake um, point people often have within grants that you fund? good question and um, I'm not sure I, I know the answer. Um, I can see that there's an exchange between my colleague Anne and, and, and yourself there, kids. Um, I, I mean, I think that the first thing to say is that, that we have recognised that, as I mentioned, within operational and academic institutions, that this expertise is not typically embedded within those teams. So it's something that we have to actively solicit. Um, many academic institutions are starting to incorporate that component either by upskilling um, their own uh, research staff or by um, bringing more people on board to, to help with that. Similarly, um, operational organizations, uh, some operational organizations have embedded their own um, evidence and sort of learning focal points who are really kind of tapped into what's going on operationally, what operational research do we need to be funding, um, and then how do we use that to drive change. So some institutions, I mean MSF is one that I'm familiar with, but, but Oxfam and others as well, have that sort of expertise embedded within the institution, and it's a matter of linking them into the research proposal that you're developing um, as, as a named focal point or as somebody to whom um, the team will look for, for for that sort of technical support when the time is when the time is right. 
and they're not I, I should say in, in more direct response to your question they're not necessarily people who have um, research expertise or necessarily humanitarian expertise but rather uh, people who are uh, have experience of, of communications and 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 other sort of um, specialties that that we, that we haven't historically been looking for in these sort of research consortia. Thanks very much, James. Um, so, in our last uh, two minutes before we take a, a break. Um, we do have just a couple more insights that have come through in relation to this question. Um, one person mentions that they've had re reviewers reject the proposal based on not having enough information about the project in a situation where the length of the proposal was limited by the donor. So I imagine, you know, what, what I've also seen in proposals is that sometimes the nature of the formatting of the proposal doesn't give you enough time to both describe the intervention and also describe your, your research methodology so I can recognize how that could be a limitation. Um, another point was that if I if I think it is legitimate that donors screen uh, propo proposals to increase success, in which way could they help support in case of a poor results or failure? So I think that's a really valid point, and I, I think we are seeing quite a few more donors within the sector having um, briefs to potential applicants. I know Elra often does this um, so that they can explain what they're looking for for each call. Um, but similarly, I think we've seen an increase in the number of uh, donors that are kind of having an iterative revision with their applicants um, after the initial uh, concept note has been uh, submitted. And I think that can really help to, to strengthen proposals and make sure that they that any kind of pitfalls or limitations of a proposal are identified early and planned for. Um, great, okay, so we'll take um, a 15 minute break now and then we'll be coming back after the break with those examples of uh, research designs that have been found to work quite well in crises. Um, so we'll, uh, if you could uh, grab a cup of tea or coffee and then rejoin us at quarter past the hour. Thank you. Welcome back everybody um, to the session um, and welcome to those who have just joined us. Um, I'm Lauren de Guy from the London School and I'll be I'll be kind of going through the next session with us. So um, if we can go to the first slide of the presentation, please. I just want to, uh, if anybody who has just joined us, um, please do introduce yourselves in the chat box. Um, we've got a really kind of great range of organisations attending today, so it's always really great to see who you are. Um, so session number two, I think we're on the wrong slide, because um, we're in session but I'll continue anyway, uh, is about thinking about kind of research studies and research design. Um, so the operational and academic research community both play an important role in addressing the evidence gaps in humanitarian WASH, particularly as you know, there's important questions that can only be answered by conducting research in humanitarian settings. Um, however, as evidence is generated and evidence is growing, you know, we need to think about the designs and keeping them robust and what methodologies we can be using in such settings. So today I'm going to just present, um, I'm going to hand over to some other presenters on three examples of pragmatic study designs. So research on WASH that's been conducted in humanitarian settings um, that we perhaps can learn from and we can share the examples. Um, I'm just going to ask the tech team to move to the slide that says session two. So no, go back to uh, Keep going back all the way to session two. It should be a slide, slide 22, if you can. There we go, that's it, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, cool, so if I can move you on one slide, then slide 23. Great, so the first example we have today um, is a partnership between LSHDM and Save the Children funded by HIF and, or ELRA, and this will be presented by Maud um, and Montano in the, in the first video. So if I can ask for the first video to be played, please. Thanks very much. Hi everyone, my name is Maud. I am a researcher at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and I work in the environmental health group. So I'm going to present to you the Surprise Soap project, which is basically an example of a very innovative small-scale hand washing promotion conducted in emergency settings and aimed at children aged between 5 and 12. 
We're calling this Beyond Proof of Concept because this is an intervention which was actually tested in Iraq in 2018. And based on the promising result that we found, we're now moving beyond proof of concept towards scale by testing this intervention in other emergency settings in a multi-site study and using a more rigorous study design. So we all know the benefits, the public health benefits of hand washing with soap and the high burden of diarrhea and acute respiratory infections in children. Uh, we're used to working in general with children who are aged under five. However, there is a high burden of disease among older children as well, uh, notably children who are aged five and up. And uh, within this age group, what we find is that hand washing with soap prevalence is very low, so it can be as low as 2%. And uh, this is the reason why we wanted to focus with this age group. We've all had vast experience uh, working in the promotion of hygiene and, and hand washing. And um, what we find is that despite decades of, of hand washing promotion, we're still at a stage where we observe a lack of hand washing uh, behavior change. So basically the type of approach that we're using seem not to be effective. This is a reason why we wanted to find a new way um, to approach hand washing and specifically in emergency settings. So what type of intervention were we after? In uh, emergency settings, we were basically looking for an intervention which would be rapidly deployable, which would reach in and out of school children, because this is very important in early phases of emergencies when schools may not be set up yet, but also reaching out of school children will enable us to target young girls who may not be in schools. Also, we wanted to avoid using health-based messages because studies have shown that the traditional health-based messages used to promote hand washing and hygiene uh, may not be effective at triggering behavior change. So as a solution, we were looking to design an intervention which would require little implementation, little, sorry, hygiene promoters training uh, which would be delivered at a household level as opposed to school level, which is usually where hygiene promotion targeting children is being delivered. And we also wanted to de develop an intervention which would be using motives as opposed to traditional health-based messages. And this is pretty much how Surprise Soaps came about. So Surprise Soap is an idea which was developed by Save the Children, and uh, Claudio Diola was very instrumental in proposing the collaboration with LSHM to evaluate surprise soaps. As mentioned previously, this is an intervention which is targeting children aged between five and 12. And it's a very simple concept aimed to appeal to children's curiosity and play. And it's delivered at household uh, session in very short, household level, sorry, in very short sessions. Uh, about five to 10 minutes maximum. It's based on fun. We're not using any health-based messaging. And the simple idea is that children will want to wash their hands more to reach the toys faster. So as mentioned, we worked in uh, Iraq in uh, 2018. So this is uh, an intervention which was tested in Iraq, as mentioned. We worked in Sharia camp within the Yazidi population. This was a very simple camp in the sense that, relatively simple camp in the sense that we didn't face any security issues or access issues. Um, we had very good, there were very good um, access to soap and water in the camps. Children who had high exposure to hygiene promotion in the past and the population was very stable. The soap was co-designed by the children in the camp and our partners feel ready. So basically feel ready, will organize workshops with the children. They will gather their inputs, then they will 3D print the soaps. They will bring back the soap to the children who will test the soaps and then feel ready will again gather their inputs, 3D print the soaps again, uh, having integrated the new ideas that the, the children would have and so forth. So it was a very intensive process, but we really wanted the children to like the soap, to want to use the soap and to want to play with the toys. So we ended up with those round shaped, shaped soap. As you can see, they're very colorful with um, different animals within the soap and of different colors. So just to give you a more visual representation of the study and the study design, we worked uh, within 80 households 
divided in two groups. So one group was uh, only received, um, sorry, one group uh, received a surprise soap. So hygiene promoters de delivered the surprise soap. Uh, and the intervention also comprised glitter games, playing glitter games with the children and uh, hand washing demonstration. In the control group, Hygiene promoters also delivered uh, soap, but those were just plain soap with no toys inside. The soaps were identical to the surprise soap. And uh, hygiene promoters also delivered hygiene education sessions using basically the typical traditional health-based messages that they were already delivering in the camp. And uh, there, they also did some uh, hand washing demonstration. So as mentioned, this was a very short uh, intervention, maximum 10 minutes. And we evaluated the intervention effects um, after four weeks of implementation using three hours of direct observation within households. This is basically a picture to show you what the soap looks like in Iraq. Uh, as you can see, it's very colorful. Um, yeah, very appealing, I would say. <laughs> We had very amazing results um, with this first study. We found that children who received the surprise soap were four times more likely to wash their hands with soap after key moments compared to children who were in the control group. This was very amazing for a hand washing study because more often than not, we tend to find that hand washing studies have small to no improvement. So we were very surprised uh, at the large effect that we found. Also, we were very surprised to see that only in one household, the soap was broken to get to the, to the, to the toys more rapidly, basically. We're expecting that numbers to be higher. And this is something that we called a uh, toy cheat. Um, we published the result of this study in the International Journal of Hygiene and Environmental Health. So you can access the results and have more details on the implementations and the rationale and so forth. This brings me to the new study that we're conducting now in Somalia and Sudan with our new partners, Action Against Hunger and Care, and Civil Children really help us establishing those new collaboration. We're still working with Civil Children, but they're playing a more advisory role in these new projects. The study is on a larger scale. We're working in 200 households in both sites, so 200 households in Somalia, 200 households in Sudan. And we're using a more rigorous study design, namely um, evaluating this, the intervention in a randomized controlled trial. Those two sites are more challenging than in Iraq because we're working with a population which is not stable. We're working in uh, settings which have security issues, so notably in Somalia, where there are armed conflict with uh, study settings where camps um, are difficult to access based on security reasons, but also um, poor infrastructures. And also the children have been, uh, have had low exposure to hygiene promotion. So it's the same basically idea of delivering surprise soap in uh, the intervention group, uh, which would be composed of 100 households in each site and the plain soap intervention in 100 households in each um, 100 control households in each site. And the idea for this study was to is actually, sorry, to assess whether if we work in more challenging settings where our humanitarian partners were not involved in designing and developing the intervention, where we did not conduct any extensive formative research to design, to co-design the soap with your children, whether basically the intervention will still be as effective as what we observe in Iraq. We're also interested in knowing whether after four weeks, the children will be bored or whether they will still want to engage and play, engage with the soap and play with the, with the toys. So we're testing the intervention effects over 16 weeks. This is basically the company uh, which manufactured the soaps for us. So the name is Kima and it's a company which is based in Jordan. And it was rather difficult to find a company which would be able to manufacture the soap for us because we're after specific characteristics such as size, which would avoid that the soap um, be choking hazards. So the soaps were actually handmade. Um, yeah. <laughs> 
So in terms of successes, um, I think those are self-evident from the study results. So we were able to design a rapidly deployable innovative intervention suitable for relatively non-challenging emergency settings. Uh, this is what we saw in Iraq, where limited hygiene promoter training was required, where we could reach both in and out of school children, and also where we found some very promising short-term results um, in terms of improving children hygiene and washing practices. In terms of challenges, obviously uh, the list is a bit longer. Um, as the rest of the world, we face challenges which were linked to the pandemic. So basically travel restrictions, ship, shipping restrictions, uh, restrictions as it pertains to research activities. We also face challenges which are inherent to humanitarian settings, such as working in populations which are unstable with security issues. So this is basically um, specifically as it pertains to the new settings where we're working, so Somalia and Sudan. Um, and also we, based on the COVID-19 pandemic and security issues, we've had to, for, 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 for now, completely manage um, the new study remotely and obviously also train staff remotely. We've also faced challenges where uh, our in-country partners, because they're working on different projects, uh, sometimes they uh, completely move <laughs> to the other projects where they are uh, where they are hired, and that means that we have to find new coordinators to manage the project for us in country, um, which in 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 a sense create challenges of ownership. Um, um, you know, having to retrain staff and also having to recreate this enthusiasm with the project. Last but not the least, as we researchers, there is always this challenge of reconciling our wish to conduct studies that are as rigorous as possible. But at the same time, uh, we need to be pragmatic and adapt to the realities and challenges of our research settings. So I wish to emphasize that the challenges that we face are inherent uh, to humanitarian settings, as I said previously. And as researchers, we basically must have stamina we must be pragmatic and adapt rapidly to the changing conditions on the ground. And we also need to ensure that there's a high quality of communication with our partners throughout the projects to ensure that uh, issues are flagged early and solutions can be found jointly. So we are working with amazing partners uh, on the Surprise Soap projects. And uh, thanks to that, we've managed to overcome challenges together as a consortium. In the projects uh, that we're working on right now, we are at the stage where we're almost done training the enumerators and we're going to move very shortly into recruiting participants. Thank you very much for your attention. I, I would like to thank again our partners, Save Your Children, Feel Ready, Action Against Hunger and Care. And I am looking forward to hearing your questions and comments. Great, and, and thanks to Maud for that uh, presentation on the Surprise Soap project. We've had loads of questions coming in uh, on the research and, and the presentation, so we'll leave that for the Q&A um, session at the end. Maud, do feel free, obviously you can reply in the chat box to uh, many of the people here who have those, those smaller questions. So I'm going to move on to the, the next uh, example. Um, if you could bring up the slides, please. Um, Thank you. And so this is from the TISA study, which is a cluster randomized control trial for the effect of a wash kit combined with standard outpatient treatment on severe acute malnutrition recovery in Senegal. And this is a collaboration between LSHTM, ACF and Larta Senegal. And this was funded by BHA and the ACF Foundation. Um, why today we're including this as an example in uh, our kind of pragmatic study designs is that this study involves a cluster randomized control trial a cost-effective evaluation, a process evaluation, and an AMA, AMR study. So Janab is going to present to us the kind of intricate nature of these multiple study components, how the study's been going, and, and perhaps some successes and some honest challenges um, that that study's experienced, both within the context and with this uh, study design. So over to the next video for the, um, for the second recording. Thank you. Hello, my name is Janab Ndiaye. I am a researcher at Action Against Hunger. Action contre la faim. I am going to present the TISA project as an example of research designs and methods that can be used for research in humanitarian crises. TISA stands for Integrated Treatment of Acute Undernutrition. 
This project emerged from the question, can the addition of a sample household water treatment and hygiene promotion intervention to severe acute malnutrition improve recovery? To answer this question, a cluster randomized control trial was developed to assess the effect of combining a sample wash kit with standard outpatient treatment of severe acute malnutrition on recovery rates in northern Senegal. The specific objective of the project are to assess the impact of the TISA intervention on some recovery and other health outcomes, the effect of the intervention on the contamination of household drinking water, and the cost effectiveness, feasibility, and acceptability of the TISA intervention. The design of the project is a CRCT randomized by health facilities. The control arm corresponds to the standard SAM treatment protocol in place in Senegal, and the intervention arms consist of the standard SAM treatment protocol with the TISA intervention. It corresponds to a wash package that includes a wash kit with one plastic container, an aquatic drinking water treatment product sufficient for the duration of the SAM treatment with drinking water treatment promotion, three bars of soap with hygiene promotion. All OTP admitted uncomplicated SAM cases aged between 6 and 59 months are eligible for enrollment in the trial. Participants recruited at the OTP admission are followed for eight weeks and we have a target sample of 2,000 children. The project is implemented in 86 treatment facilities in northern Senegal, spread out across two departments including four districts, Dara, Linger, Pété and Podor. Operational implementation is led by Action Contre la Fin Senegal, while the scientific direction is shared between the LSHTM, the LARTES Research Laboratory on Economic and Social Transformation from the Sharon Tadiop University in Dakar and ACF France. In addition to the effectiveness assessment, three sub-studies are nested in the project. First, there is the cost effectiveness analysis led by ACF France that aim to estimate the incremental cost effectiveness between trial arm. It will be performed with a societal perspective to help support health policy decision making in the Senegalese context. There is also a qualitative component led by the LARTES. Um, it will be based on focus group discussion and interviews and will assess the compliance, acceptability, feasibility and sustainability of the TISA intervention. Finally, an antimicrobial resistance analysis will also be included. It will be led by the LSHTM and it will determine the prevalence of relevant antimicrobial resistant genes in stool among children discharged from the SAM OTP. The project involves numerous stakeholders, including the Senegalese MOH, local health system, local follow-up committees with representatives of authorities across various sectors, academic and NGO researchers, operational actors, and the UNICEF. The strength of the project include the fact that the study responds to evidence demand from the national policy, for national policy scale-up from the Senegalese MOH. The setting chosen is generalizable to the Salah division, where SAM is a major public health issue. The study benefited from a long development phase with all the stakeholders, which enabled to ensure that the wash kit would be contextually appropriate and operationally relevant. We were also able to develop an information and education communication material culturally appropriate and reusable. Furthermore, it allowed us to initiate early the communication on the project to facilitate uptake. This was done through numerous field visits via pilot testing of the TISA intervention. An, an important disadvantage of the study is its very large study area. The 86 trial sites are spread out across 28,000 square kilometers with associated logistical and acceptability challenges. The pragmatic design allows us to evaluate the effectiveness of the TISA intervention in real-life routine practices conditions. However, this means that the trial is based on the existing health system already facing difficulties, like uh, an heavy staff workload, infrastructures, and stockout problems. This requires an extensive monitoring and coordination with the health system and the regional and district level. There were some various ch challenges faced by the TISA since we obtained funding. 
First, there were some logistical and procurement issues. Specific research and laboratory supplies could not be procured locally, and international shipment and custom procedure caused major delay to the project. Just after the material was received and the staff was trained on how to use it, the COVID-19 pandemic hit Senegal. The Senegalese government declared the state of emergency, restricted movement between region and banned gathering of people of more than 10 people. This led to a nine month postponement of the trial launch. Furthermore, there is currently a temporary decentralization of the SAM treatment from OTP to the community, which is impacting the enrollment rate at our trial site. The CRCT design of the trial has some advantages and disadvantages. The two arms design enable comparability in terms of effectiveness, cost effectiveness and acceptability. The design is robust enough to inform policy on potential scale up and it enables us to acquire additional fundings for the sub studies. However, it has also some disadvantages. The main one is the need for a large sample size, target uh, sample size of 2000 children necessary to have the statistical power to detect differential effectiveness. It necessitates a longer study period to obtain results in context with frequent staff turnover. It requires a significant amount of time for each stakeholders that can be underestimated, and it requires research capacity from operational actors. Finally, a high standard of trial governance is needed, like the pre-registration of the study in clinicaltrial.gov, the building of an independent scientific committee and a data safety monitoring board to ensure the do no harm principle on the study participants. In terms of loss and learns, I would say that to work on a research project in a humanitarian setting is working with um, very different partners that have the same objectives but very different opinion on the best way to attain them. Therefore, an extremely close collaboration is needed to enable communication and knowledge transfer between the researchers from high and low resource settings on local and international relevance of the research question and design. A close proximity is needed between the community and the project team that should begin in the early days of the protocol development. An extremely close collaboration should be put in place between the operational staff and researcher on research requirement and feasibility. Furthermore, a strong communication is needed between the manager of each sub-study component that sometimes be belong to different research fields, but is necessary to ensure the synergy and the efficiency of the entire project. Constant interaction is needed between the team project and the existing health system to ensure a robust implementation of the pragmatic design. And finally, a clear communication is needed between the team project and the funders in case of unexpected event beyond control. To conclude, the TISA project illustrates how a pragmatic but strong design can evaluate a worse intervention in crisis. It has been developed keeping in mind that the high quality of evidence is needed to guide allocation in low resource, high burden public health setting. Why it has been challenging such Research efforts are critical to build a more efficient strategies to uh, respond to the need of people in humanitarian context. Only with meaningful coordination between the WASH actors, other sectors, communities and funders, we will be able to face future humanitarian emergency. Thank you for your attention and I would be happy to answer any further question you might have on the project. Thank you. Great, and thanks to Janaba for that presentation on the TISA trial and the studies that it encompasses. Um, please do put your questions in the chat for Janaba as we'll come to a QA and a discuss these three studies um, that we're presenting today. Um, in thinking about I'm going to move straight to the, the third presentation. Um, the connection is a little bit delayed, so there we go, uh, on my side. Great, so this is a process evaluation. The collaboration was between LSHTM and MSF. And this study was actually funded by MSF. And um, yours truly will be presenting watch the presentation. Thank you very much. 
Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I'm Lauren de Mello-Guy from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and I'm going to give a presentation on just one of the examples of a pragmatic study design that could be used for WASH research in humanitarian crises. So, uh, the study which we're talking about today is the distribution of hygiene kits during a cholera outbreak in DRC, and what we conducted was a process evaluation. So, our partners for the study were the Ministry of Health, uh, MSF, UNICEF, and the London School. And you can see here that we had quite a large research team, which doesn't even begin to mention all of the enumerators and the study population themselves. Because I'm not going to go into too much detail about the study or the study results in itself, um, I will give you a quick overview of the methods and then I'll kind of talk about the advantages and the challenges that we had with this study. Um, but why it is an interesting example as um, research that can be conducted in, in crisis settings. So study site, uh, we're looking at Kasai Oriental in DRC, so that's Southern DRC. The study design is a process evaluation, which I'll come to in a little bit uh, more detail in a second. And our objective of this study was to understand the successes and the barriers of hygiene kit distribution um, as a strategy for cholera control in order to understand how the intervention was delivered, how it was used by the population and the potential for scalability. Um, from this evaluation, we've been able to propose recommendations to optimise future programmes as well. So again, if anyone's not too familiar, a hygiene kit uh, within this context is a 10 litre bucket with tap to create a hand washing device, a 20 litre container for water, um, different water treatment products, either Aquatabs or Pure, and then a kilogram of soap. And MSF's um, guidelines specify that this hygiene kit is given at the point of admission of a suspected cholera case to a cholera treatment unit. Um, so you can see here in the photo on the top that we have um, somebody demonstrating the kit and the components to the household contacts of a suspected case who's been admitted to the facility. Now, again, I just want to kind of a brief overview of what we did. Our study population are things that you all recognise. Um, we talked to households who had received the intervention. We talked to the different implementers. We talked to implementers at MSF. We talked to the local government, uh, other NGOs. And then we analysed a lot of programme reports and data sets. And I just want to emphasise that the data collection was of things that were already available to us. Yeah, this is the kind of why it's a pragmatic study design and why we could use it in this way. So we reviewed inventories, you know, I went through supply chain manifests and receipts of how many things were purchased and when they arrived and then what quantities. We reviewed the clinical data, the data that was already being collected by the epidemiologists, by the national health system. We conducted observations, so we wanted to understand how the interventions were being given out at the healthcare facility, just by watching the kind of implementation staff in action. We reviewed all of these programme documents, kind of piecing together what people were saying and how they were reporting the information and what had happened in the intervention. And then we conducted kind of interviews, and I guess this is our additional piece of data collection that we added to the study, where we interviewed the households. We asked them, you know, about their satisfaction, about how they found using the kit, what they preferred, um, you know, any barriers that they had and any challenges that they faced in using these kits. We also did the same for implementers, you know, we wanted to talk to them about how, you know, is this response different, what are the challenges that they found, and kind of really piecing together that kind of really overview picture of what happened during this response. So often I think we come to a response, it's all go, 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 lots of energy, lots of energy, and we forget then to reflect. But it is written down, you know, we are all really good at reporting things, at least internally, maybe not publishable externally all of the time, but we do account for a lot of these things and the challenges that we face and some of those issues. So again, all we did is that we looked at a lot of this data that was already in existence. So advantages. Well, I guess the first one I want to come to with the process evaluation and why it's a useful design is that it's based on program design and theory of change. You know, you develop a theory of change for your response, for your program. Um, so that's recognisable by a non-research team. You're using the same language, the same jargon, you know, activities, inputs, outputs, etc. that people are familiar with. And so understanding the, the design of the study and what you're trying to achieve and what you're trying to figure out is really understandable by your study team. So quite useful with talking to different kind of levels of staff and people with different familiarities with, with research. Um, secondly, uh, I guess one advantage is that this was conducted in a real time during an outbreak, you know, the study design allowed us 
to kind of pick things up and move dynamically with the team and kind of moving to their timelines, not setting up these big studies in advance or even knowing our study site. You know, we get a call and two weeks later we're in the location. Um, so the study design allows for perhaps some generalizability, you can know, you can think about or replicability to other study settings. You could, you know, outside of controlled study conditions especially, um, is a useful kind of thought process to go through saying, okay, well this we could use this in another settings. We could produce rigorous research in other settings. Yeah. Uh, third advantage, we had a dedicated research team, but they were also humanitarians. Um, our, our data collectors who went to households and interviewed people used to be hygiene promoters. They understood both the context, but they understood the organization and they understood therefore the systems and how everything worked. And so we, we also were allowed to keep that research capacity within the team, within the staff that you had already, and build that kind of nationally up, um, rather than perhaps losing some of our team, you know, through attrition or moving on to different projects when the research ended. You know, there's pros and cons of both scenarios, but I think that was really valuable for us, being able to understand the systems um, at play. I guess one big advantage is, you know, and perhaps as a larger conversation for another time, is that this study was funded by MSF. It wasn't funded by a donor that had specific timelines or had specific budget amounts either. You know, we had a ballpark figure of money we were allowed to spend, but it allowed us to have really flexible timelines because we weren't dependent on reporting um, to a, a donor, perhaps. We were able to hire kind of a lot of people and a lot of team and train a lot of people in preparation for this kind of very adjustable timeline, it allowed us that flexibility. It also meant we could have, we could buy in all of the supplies, right? Although the intervention itself was part of MSF's kind of general strategy, and so of course you know they paid for their own intervention. The study wasn't related, dependent on that intervention, but you know the. The fact that we knew there was going to be the supply, we weren't relying on a supply chain mechanism to come in for allowing the study to start. Yeah, the study started with or without the intervention, but you're using the organisation themselves to do so. So again, that's one kind of big advantage of this study that may not be applicable to many other settings or many other organisations. So perhaps also a, a big disadvantage. Other things, um, I just really want to reflect on this and thinking about what this research capacity development workshop's about. It's about recognising that a lot of these skills or the data collection methods and the data sources are already within all of these organisations that we work with. Um, it's within, you know, these existing data sources are what we use for this process evaluation, most of which were really familiar to our non-research non-researcher staff. Um, it was really easily accessible, you know, it was all there, it was all collated at the end of the response. During the response we had all of the access to all of those reports. And there is a real richness to that data as long as you know what you're going to do with it. Some of it of course was extraneous and not needed, but you know, still having that available to us was meant that kind of, you know, the resource saving, um, time saving of having that data available was really useful. So thinking about what m &E structures already exist in an organisation can be so beneficial to kind of tweak them and change them to allow research and some really solid evaluations to be conducted. Again, uh, we were already talking to these populations. So, you know, pop the population in who are being received in care were the study population. We were already talking to the implementers. Half the team used to be implementers. You know, they had that kind of interaction with the staff already. We weren't having to search people out or find study participants um, kind of in different areas and different places. And then I think one of the biggest advantages is, is the this, this study and the outcomes of interest for the study were both of interest operationally and academically. You know, you're, you're kind of meeting the demands of two institutions here um, and two different ways of thinking, perhaps, and two different um, schools of thought. But again, we kind of try to marry that together with, OK, let's understand the delivery of what we're doing, the implementation of what we're doing. And so that was interesting to both um, parties in this partnership. So disadvantages or challenges, let's say, to this study design and to this um, project. Well, first, we had to wait for an outbreak. Yeah, we had to think about which outbreaks and which countries were going to be having cholera outbreaks in the next couple of years, uh, kind of pre-positioning ourselves and supplies and training different teams. We had to also think about a mission who would accommodate the study and be receptive to this type of idea. You know, not all projects and not all sites and not all people are receptive to the idea of research and rigorous evaluation in their projects. It's cumbersome and it 
it can be cumbersome I mean and it can be a, d a delicate bat uh, a delicate conversation to have or diplomacy is definitely needed to understand each other and what you want to achieve out of that relationship second well there were operational challenges you know it's an acute crisis uh, there were supply chain issues and getting the intervention to the site was you know outside of the research control it wasn't a controlled study but so we had to rely on that and this resulted in actually limited coverage of the intervention itself the intervention that we were here to evaluate wasn't as widely distributed as we'd expected it to be. So kind of understanding that and kind of adapting the research accordingly had to be quite dynamic and on the spot. I really want to stress this third point here is the fine line between operations and independent evaluation. I already mentioned that our data collection team were employees of MSF. There is a line between what is independent evaluation, right? Myself, I was also employed by MSF. So I, am I an independent evaluator? I would hope so. But there is that fine line between the two and what biases you may introduce because of the, the MSF vest you wear or the organisation you represent or the thoughts and feelings about different organisations, not just about the one you're evaluating, but about the setting itself. So it's really good for us to be aware of what constraints that has within within an evaluation and sometimes perhaps you do need an independent evaluator completely for the study but sometimes you don't so it's again an argument for both sides there now other disadvantages you know these are kind of i'd say happening now and and as we've produced the results and we're kind of disseminating them and discussing them and seeing what they actually mean is it's been really challenging uptake um, by the organization Due to our potentially negative, I'd say, study findings, we found really low coverage of the intervention. We found a really quite delayed response. Um, you know, this can be perceived in quite a negative manner. So perhaps there is a challenge in accepting some of these findings or to, to kind of know how to use them because it's hard to kind of have those conversations. Again, it'd be the same with challenging uptake in the country and with other partners. Is this a replicable intervention? Do we understand what actually went into this and how we could use this intervention ourselves or will we find the same issues? Unfortunately, we didn't include a cost effectiveness component to the study design. So I think that's really useful when talking to other, other implementers is what does this cost? You know, could we produce the same intervention, but actually, do we have the budget to? And so it's unfortunate that we don't have that data within this study to be able to produce those numbers and show what this does cost um, for what could be quite a promising intervention. You know, we always have to ask ourselves as researchers or as program designers or implementers, will this intervention actually be effective in other settings? Yeah, is this study all about where it was and the time and the context and this population that the intervention seemed to have um, was effective, was, could be used, was received quite well, you know, but is that going to be comparable to other settings? You know, how much can we take these results on? Another one, could it feasibly be implemented in other outbreaks or with other organisations? Do they have the budget? Do they have the team or the resources to be able to implement an intervention of this nature? So these are just kind of questions that we're still thinking through. What, how can we use these results? You know, what, how is the study design being useful to us? And then, you know, a question that we always have to ask ourselves, where are the local partners in this evaluation and what do they think of the intervention and the study design itself? So again, I just want to be transparent with study timelines. You know, this wasn't a short study at all in no means. And, um, you know, we had the project inception and talking about this back in 2016 and a series of scoping visits and writing protocols and ethics applications that took forever. You know, we finally get going in 2018. But then, you know, you've got to think about all the data analysis and writing the manuscripts and the end of the project was in 2020. So we're talking about three and a half years to do this evaluation. So it's thinking about the time commitment that that needs, both on the implementer side, the academic side and the donor. Thinking about what it takes to produce research of this nature is something to really kind of consider um, and perhaps be more aware of when you're making your funding proposals um, and so on and so forth. So here are just some of the outputs that we have from the study. I'm not going to kind of focus on this now, but just to say that, you know, all, all of these things that went into the study um, could produce some interesting results, but it depends how they're going to be used. And I think that's the forever question we have for ourselves and, and everyone in this. Anyway, thank you very much. Great and um, brilliant questions coming through the chat.
I am going to try video for a little bit longer to see if this works. Otherwise, my connection might falter. Um, so I kind of want to round this session off with the last couple of minutes here, just thinking about a broader question for you, the audience. Um, looking at these research designs, um, what about you know when implementation of an intervention doesn't go as intended? doesn't go as planned. What does this mean? What do we learn about or um, is this a realist in there? It's my opening question. Oh. I'm going to turn off the project um it was like waiting for an outbreak or the conducive environment that we needed to conduct this research so perhaps we can go back to the slido and everyone can kind of feed in um their their questions in the slido or the chat box it's up to you on your personal preference um and thinking about those larger questions And I see a question here from Kit already. So she thinks that there's space here for small organizations to learn what we can from bigger, more researchy organizations. But this also demands a, a bit of organization or cultural change. As, as NCA, we've con contracted ACF to do an evaluation of a country level program, which could easily have been a piece of research instead. So yeah, perhaps it's about kind of creating those partnerships, but perhaps it's also creating the culture change within an organization to facilitate um, adoption of research. Uh, other questions here from thinking about lessons learned about research designs. So I'm going to come to, oh, sorry, just a question from perhaps from Brian talking about realistic or, or negative results or perhaps from the engineering side. So of course, you know, I think we can all learn from the failures and I think that's why we need to keep conducting research in these settings and pushing this forward. Um, and I agree, like we need to be publishing more negative findings. You know, Sean talked about this morning, the Nakuru Accord and things that, um, and signing up to reporting failures in, in the WASH sector. So robust research, you know, should not be prioritized over relevant and realistic research, which is a comment coming in from the Slido here. So I'm just gonna take a pause for any more kind of questions um, coming from the, from the group. Great, we've got a question here. So uh, another question saying, had all of the research partners worked together before and could they provide any insights from your projects on the successes and challenges for embarking on this research, given there were many pillars to it? So I think this question come, came from Jenny Lamb and this was to Janaba. So Janaba, if you'd like to unmute yourself, um, please feel free to reply to Jenny directly. Uh, yes, hello, thank you for uh, this question. Uh, some of the researchers had already worked together before, but not uh, really closely in a research project. They knew about each other, but they had not really, uh, really uh, worked uh, together on a research project of this size. But uh, we were able to, we were really um, grateful to have Mathias Altman, who at the time was a uh, was a researcher at ACF uh, France, and he was the one that uh, uh, developed uh, the um, a proof of concept of the kind of same uh, same study in Chad, uh, and he was able to uh, help us in the in the project development, the protocol development of the TISA trial. We were able to use his knowledge of uh, of, um, of what would be the pitfall of uh, implementing those kind of uh, of work. Uh, in the field and the difficulty uh, of um, really being integrated in the local health system and having a pragmatic design. So, so yes and no for, for um, previous knowledge of the research actors. Uh, and there was also a question on the, the successes and the challenges. So I would say that in terms of uh, challenges, the, the, the big one was really the, the delay in procurement issue and the COVID pandemic. 
that uh, really uh, led to a long uh, postponement of the of the trial. But we already um, recruited a lot of the staff, so uh, we we had them on our team. We trained them, but we could not uh, develop uh, implement the, the intervention. So that was really difficult, and it also had an impact on our budget. And uh, and also during this delay, there was some uh, some big staff turnover, so we had to train them again. So this was uh, really uh, the the biggest challenge. And uh, in terms of successes, I would say that one of the successes is to have been able to launch the trial. And then uh, I would say that um, we were able to really work in close collaboration with the, the Senegalese MOH and UNICEF. And it allowed to not have contamination of uh, our our um, intervention arms, and we were able to work with the end user of our research, and um, therefore it will help. I, I hope uh, dissemination and uptake of our results, and uh, we really try to uh, to take into account how our research results will be used in the future in the development of the project. And I believe this makes this research uh, relevant in the context. Thanks, Geneva. Um, I'm going to hand over to Maud for the for the next question. And this is a question from Angelica Fischer, asking why was there a different approach to hygiene promotion methods between between the two houses? Um, a glitter game with one group and standard hygiene education in another. It seems like there was maybe two different methods are being tested here. Um, and so perhaps you could elaborate uh, a bit further on that question, Maud. Thank you. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for your question, Angelica. Just before answering, I just would like to personally thank Julie Watson, who is one of my colleagues, and she was the lead uh, researcher on the study that we did in Iraq and, and this one, which is currently on maternity leave. So huge thank uh, for all her efforts on the surprise soap. So to come back to Angelica's question, basically, um, because we're working in emergency settings and we know that there is often a lack of access to water and sanitation and infrastructure, we know that uh, the burden of the real disease and I could resp resp respiratory infection, sorry, is very high, which means that even if we're testing a specific intervention, so we're testing the surprise soap, you still want to do some sort of promotion in the group which is not receiving the intervention that we're testing. So this is the reason why in one group we had the surprise soap and in the control group, we still had the standard, um, I guess, health slash hygiene promotion that Save the Children, our implementation partner, was already delivering in the camp where we were working. So that's the reason why we had two intervention, but we were really just testing uh, the surprise soap intervention. And, and I think I mentioned in the presentation that in the camp where we we're working in Iraq, the children had been very exposed, highly exposed to hygiene promotion. So they were very used to, you know, hand washing promotion. They were able to tell us when hands should be washed and they were very familiar with the seven steps for hand washing. So delivering in the control group, this standard health education intervention was not really a new intervention that we were, we were basically testing. I don't know if I've answered um, <laughs> the question, Angelica. <laughs> and I think Thanks, there was, Maud. Uh, and I, there was another question from Brian. I think it was about uh, standardization, um, how we made sure that the implementation was, um, the intervention was implemented similarly. And to Brian, thank you for the question. I just wanted to, because I, I specified that for us, it was uh, based on the way we train the staff that we ensure standardization. But I think you was mentioning that in another project, staff had been trained intensively, but you found a lot of variability in, in the way the intervention was implemented. And for the surprise soap, um, as I had mentioned, we're really looking for an intervention which would be very easy to implement because we're, we're aware that we're working in emergency settings where you don't really have time to train staff and you, be, you may be working also with implementation partners who may not have had a lot of experience implementing hygiene promotion and whatnot. So we're really looking to design 
um, an intervention which would require little training of, of hygiene implementers and so on. So I think for the surprise soap, um, as I explained in the presentation, it's very simple. You just have the soap with the toys inside that you distribute to the children. You explain to them that the more they wash their hands, the faster they will get to the, to the toys and that they should not break it. You do have this also glitter game, which is basically putting jelly and glitter on one of the child's hand, uh, one of the children's hand, and have them uh, handshake with um, other children so that they can see how easy it is to pass on that glitter substance into other people's hands. And then you have a hand washing demonstration to show how effective hand washing with soap is at removing the, the, the glitter and jelly. So I think it's very, very simple. And that's the reason why, and it's, and as mentioned, it just takes five to 10 minutes to implement um, the surprise soap intervention, which is why for me, I would assume that uh, it makes it easier than to, to, for the intervention to be implemented similarly by all uh, hygiene implementers. So, um, yeah, I think I have addressed all of the questions uh, on the chat. Yeah, thanks Maud and um, yeah. brilliant job there. Uh, we'll just take one more question from, from the chat before we continue with the, the session. And this is a question from Alex. Um, so in reference to roles of local partners in evaluation, what is the level of their involvement and how can transparency be improved and bias minimized between parties' expectations? Um, Alex, I think I'll speak to this a little bit. Um, so I think obviously we want to encourage local involvement as much as possible in evaluation, um, you know, in both internally and in other projects itself. I think it's about creating that research or evaluation and evaluation environment as well, thinking about how we talk to and train our staff in what is bias, uh, what is kind of the, the process of evaluating their own interventions, the program, the fidelity of how we've carried out uh, an, an intervention. And I think, you know, I think, you know, we always think about training, 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 but it's actually spending about the, the time and really going through kind of the assumptions that people make um, unconsciously as well. And I think we can kind of keep reinforcing those systems and, and, and that training within place within these organizations to allow that to happen. I think from our experience in DRC, we had teams who who had not done evaluation before, but you know, kind of really reinforcing the tools that we had and the way questions needed to be asked and triangulating all of the different pieces of data, the data that they were actually really familiar with, um, you know, different reports and different kind of structures, reporting systems that they had, but how to use those in a way that allowed um, it to be really transparent of what happened during this intervention and really understanding that, that fidelity to the implementation, implementation fidelity to what was planned to what was versus what was delivered. Um, but I'm going to end it there for the questions, and I'm going to go back to some to the slides, and I'm just going to kind of round up some some perhaps lessons that we've summarised um, from today's examples. So if I could go back to the slides, um, please. Thank you very much to the tech team. I will keep my video off so I can actually still be heard. Um, but one of the first lessons uh, from today's examples. Both, all three of the studies had really key research questions and, and ensuring that their study designs could, and methods could answer those questions, you know, keeping it really simple and keeping it really clear from, from the offset. They had spent time in understanding what was already known uh, and what no, and what was not known about their research questions. You know, we always think that many burning research questions that we might have are things that we probably have the answers to. And so not only will this strengthen your applications and proposals, thinking about what the literature is, what the evidence base is, you know, what the practice or policies are across different organizations in different settings, really helps us to avoid duplication and, and test out those kind of nuances and new designs. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, you know, we need to be thinking about uh, perhaps guiding our own organizations and, and partners in thinking about how to specify and think about different outcomes. You know, James earlier talk, talked about, you know, making things achievable. Not all studies perhaps should measure the effectiveness or impact of an intervention. You know, we have thinking about behavioral outcomes, uh, you know, for examples in the Surprise Soap project, or perhaps we think of 
other things that aren't health outcomes, the process evaluation, the cost effectiveness evaluations, I think AMR studies such as we had in the earlier examples are all things that are really interesting to ourselves operationally and academically that aren't just about effectiveness and impact, so thinking beyond those outcome measures. We can also talk about, I think this is quite a, an attractive option sometimes to both operations, uh, donors and academics, it's about a phased or outcomes or perhaps having several outcomes rather than one big meaty outcome at the end of your study, research can, as we know, definitely goes awry um, and perhaps having those interim findings that can be shared along the way, along the journey. So you're keeping that engagement with your partners, with your kind of, you know, the WASH sector community. Uh, and also allows us to mitigate any risk, perhaps if we don't have a big uh, outcome evaluation. So, you know, thinking about how we can influence practice in real time too is really important to consider within our within our study designs. Uh, next slide, please. Next, thank you. Um, and so, you know, concluding with that that we can think about pragmatic study designs. It doesn't always have to be large randomized control trials. We think about pilot studies or pilot RCTs in themselves are still really valuable. You know, this, this you know, you, I don't want to go into the hierarchy of studies, but, you know, thinking about cross-sectional studies or cohort studies or barrier analysis. I mentioned process evaluation a lot because, again, it was really simple for us to do in that context. And so there are many designs here that can be applicable that don't always have to be these big, large um, studies that we, you know, we, we want to see at the kind of impact evaluations um, being published. Think about the other sort of designs that can be used. And then, you know, but when it does come to designing and finalizing the study of choice, we need to think about using perhaps study design checklists. Are we factoring in, in everything that we need in, you know, a study design? Are we, are we capturing everything? I think this will really help with our proposal development and submitting research in the future. There are many, many existing uh, checklists out there for how, of what study designs are. Think about the equator network, that's something, a resource that many people can go to. Or thinking about just using standardized indicators. You know, we work in the WASH sector, the JMP have made this incredible, incredible list of indicators that we could all be using all of the time. Sphere indicators the same way. So we have these indicators already that we can be using frequently and incorporating into our research and not trying to reinvent the wheel each time with these, you know, a myriad of different indicators available to us. Um, next slide, please. So lastly, uh, making sure our data collection methods um, match our study design and using existing data. I think all three studies could really stress this, that they understood what is and can be counted as baseline data. They either they had to perhaps in the case of Surprise SOAP and the TISA trial, establish a control group or a comparison that's, that's rigorous, can stand up to testing. But in, they're also going to be using monitoring data, which is a normative part of many programs in the in the WASH sector and across all of our agencies. So using that data, it can be really rich, but again, it depends on how we're analysing it. So I also want to stress here that it's about how to strike a balance, perhaps between the use of qualitative and quantitative data collection, and how to balance that within your study design and using kind of a, maybe a mixed methods approach. And, you know, always a point to make is to not undervalue qualitative data collection methods and analysis. You know, they can provide a really deep understanding of the problem, the context, and help adapt our program. You know, we think about how to influence change and on, on that kind of program and policy level. We're thinking about our qualitative data can be really rich in helping those uh, changes to be made. So next slide, please. And that brings us just to time and uh, we're going to be taking a break now and I hope please to keep your questions in the chat coming through um, but we're going to be going on session three where we're going to be talking about um, kind of top tips let's say uh, from the donor and implementer perspective on, um, on, on WASH research in humanitarian crisis. So thank you very much for your, your attention and this session and dealing with perhaps a few of our technical issues and uh, we'll see you at um, in 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Everybody from the break and thank you for joining us to, to the new faces for this session. Um, if you have just joined us, please do write your name, uh, which organisation you work for and where you're watching from in the chat box. It's always great to see uh, the kind of global representation we have or the different agencies that are joining us today. So this session, uh, session number three is the last session of today and the last session of your Friday before you can all uh, be free for the weekend, is um, looking to the future. 
Uh, if we can pull up the slides, thank you very much. Um, this morning we looked at the barriers to conducting high quality research in humanitarian settings. We heard both from the implementer and the donor perspective on this. We then kind of went through some examples, the three examples we had today of studies that have been carried out, uh, evaluating and looking at investigating uh, WASH interventions in different crisis settings amongst different agencies and with different donors and, and using very different study designs and looking at different outcomes. Um, we also heard from them and the requirements of, of the relationships it took to, to kind of put forward these, uh, these, to conduct these studies. And perhaps then the challenges they faced and some of the dilemmas they faced in conducting research, both within these settings, uh, with, with these partners, with high staff turnover and, and, and the kind of complexities of the research in itself. But now uh, is our opportunity, at least for the, the next hour of today, is to look to the future. Um, to look forward to the changing landscape of WASH research um, and kind of what that looks like and how to basically improve proposal submissions for WASH for research uh, in humanitarian crises. You know, we want to keep we want to keep doing some research um, and keep making that better and better. And so we're looking forward. Next slide, please. So how has the landscape of WASH research in crisis changed? Well, um, just from a quick PubMed search, you can see here this graph uh, that WASH research in crisis settings is increasing year on year. And we're seeing that really that growth of, um, of, kind of evaluations and research and, and innovative ideas ideas that are, are being tested in the sector. But we still have these remaining questions and you know we're not answering those today, but does the increase in research equate to more evidence-based programs and policy. Is this growth in evidence? Is it nationally led? Who are the partners leading this? Is it all being published by one group or, uh, or one organization? And so, you know, thinking about how to dissect some of those trends is something that's gonna be important as we keep pushing the WASH research agenda forward. Next slide, please. Ooh, next slide. Uh, I'll move on. I think my connection is my, that's me, that's the, the delay. So uh, slide back, please, if you can. Um, so thinking about that, that agenda and the landscape, you know, does that equate to, is there more funding available for WASH research in humanitarian crisis? Has that increased? I think a couple of, the, a couple of donors on the call would say yes, that definitely has increased the WASH research in crises. But, you know, we want to see, is that a growing trend and what's that going to be looking like in the future? You know, just because funding has increased for, for research, has the quality of proposal submissions improved? Again, questions for many of the donors on the call that we probably have and they could answer better than I. Um, are they seeing that improvement in, in proposal submissions from these grants? I think we're. I think I'm back. Oh, in audio. Yeah, just about, Lauren. Go ahead. I'm back. Uh, great. I do apologise. I am coming from South Sudan, and my internet connection is not the strongest. Even though I did fly back to Juba specifically for this. Um, so, bringing us back to then, if you can bring the slides back up. So the next slide, please. Uh, and we're looking forward then to the EHF, you know, rounding out this week is the Emergency Environmental Health Forum. And I think this is one trend at least I can tell you all about is that submissions to the EHF have increased year on year for data that is available since 2012. You know, we're seeing the increase in submissions over time. Um, we've added posters in 2019 onwards. And although plenary presentations have said the same, you know, to fit into our typical two day schedule, the fact that we're seeing an increase in submissions and hopefully that translates to an increase in quality in the presentation we've seen, hopefully most of you watched this week, and um, it's just paramount to show how uh, WASH research is really kind of improving and increasing across the sector. Next slide, please. 
So what's next for WASH Research in Crises? Well, in June 2021, so this year and this month, uh, we're going to be launching a global prioritization exercise for WASH Research in Humanitarian Crisis. The aim of this is to set, to seek an agenda, um, to generate a consensus-based research agenda that can steer the WASH in humanitarian crisis field for the next 10 years. You know, we have to, of course, keep in mind the changing landscape of aid um, and the funding cuts that we are experiencing and, you know, to WASH in particular and to WASH research but we also have to think about the covid related momentum around wash that we have now and and to capitalize on that funding to kind of in, you know to harness the research agenda and kind of set a path that we'd like to follow over the next 10 years so um just a call out to all of you on this on this webinar we will be in contact with all of you for this research agenda you are and uh, the people we're going to be talking to so just to make sure that it is aware and it's on your horizon there in the future and uh, so the next slide please so now I'm going to hand over to James Smith from Elra, and he's going to walk through kind of some, some top tips, let's say, on how to improve the proposals um, for WASH research in crisis settings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, so we're we're sort of coming, uh, you know, the arc of the of the workshop now is 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 approaching it, its end. We've begun today thinking a little bit about the many contextual um, challenges that that can make conducting research in humanitarian settings tricky. Um, we've talked about some of the pitfalls that we've seen in in research proposals. We've also looked at. Um, some real examples and, and, and interrogated their, their strengths and their weaknesses. Um, and as Lauren's just mentioned, we, we've, we've, we've looked at how the humanitarian health research space is changing. Um, Lauren's also referred to, to this prioritization exercise, which is a piece of work that we've commissioned as ELRA to really help us understand better where the critical knowledge gaps uh, are in the WASH sector at the moment and where we need to be investing resources uh, over the course of the next uh, decade or so. Um, with uh, the next sort of 10-15 minutes I'm going to uh, touch on a couple of the sort of top tips, if you like, or, or, or top line recommendations that we would make um, in relation to uh, research proposals moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. So, look, thinking back now to, to to my earlier session, some of the challenges that we've seen in 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 uh, proposals that have been submitted. One of the first things I would say is that we really need to um, identify and elaborate uh, exactly where the knowledge gaps are. So really demonstrating a good understanding of the literature, um, the existing evidence, uh, be it from published sources or from elsewhere, uh, and to really uh, uh, tease out exactly how your research proposal uh, advances the evidence base as it exists presently. Very important to think uh, at a very early stage about the practical elements. So we've talked a lot today about partnerships, um, some of those tricky questions related to how to identify um, local partners and whether we can do some work to uh, better map out who who is working where with what expertise uh, but that process of developing genuine partnerships and really bringing on board uh, local regional and international colleagues in a in a really kind of uh, collegial uh, and collaborative fashion uh, takes time um, and that's not something that can be done by sort of entering a new context at short notice uh, and indeed you know many of the strongest research proposals we see come from research consortia who've been working in a particular context for a very long period of time think about expertise and whether additional skill sets are needed um, the, the the added value of an anthropologist of a, of a statistician uh, of uh, other technical and disciplinary experts uh, really can't be can't be stated highly enough and as we've mentioned already some of these uh, some of the kind of key elements of, of, of a research um, development process such as seeking ethical approval can take a long time uh, also require particular expertise uh, so really factoring that in at a, at a very early stage next big big um, sort of suggestion is to be as realistic as possible now that's not to 
curb the kind of the creative mindset or, 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 or to say that we shouldn't be ambitious with what we're doing. We shouldn't be trying to work in places we haven't worked before, or we shouldn't be thinking about asking questions that we haven't asked before. Um, but rather that scale and complexity don't necessarily equate to a high quality uh, research proposal. Very important to consider that the, whether the timeline that you've set for yourselves and the budget that you've um, that you've requested are, are realistic in relation to the activities you're you're hoping to deliver. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, um, is there another slide there? You go back. Perfect. The next um, next sort of reflection from 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 our side is is this sort of focus on outcomes and objectives. Uh, really important to be very clear about what you're seeking to measure and how, of course, um, and making sure that the methods you've chosen actually match the study objectives. As I said earlier, if you're really looking at um, barriers to uptake, to be thinking seriously about a qualitative dimension um, to be thinking about different data sources uh, and different approaches, different mixed methods approaches that might be useful. Once you've identified those data sources, <clears throat> apologies, to, um, to really elaborate um, access to data, uh, quality of data, um, and other really, really kind of key elements related to sort of data management and data analysis. And something we don't see very much and this um, th th this relates loosely to to the conversation we were having earlier about failure. Um, is a real acknowledgement of biases and limitations in in research proposals. Um, it's really refreshing and 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 important to outline where the research proposal falls short, and often identifying that. Um, uh, at an early stage and explaining why, despite these limitations, the research proposal is strong um, it, it, it is, is reassuring to see from a reviewer's point of view. Uh, and finally, analysis. So, you know, the, the hard work of developing a research proposal, identifying your methodology, uh, actually collecting the data and, and responding to whatever changes might happen in the local context. Uh, you've, now, you've now gathered all of that data. Um, how exactly is data going to be analyzed? Again, um, one of the, the, the real weaknesses we see is, is in relation to analysis of qualitative data. And this is why it's really important to bring in people with the right skill set who know how to work with uh, different types of data, different, uh, different, um, different forms of data sets and so on. Um, and again, as I've mentioned earlier, what's really critical there is just making sure that your team at the outset is the right team uh, required to not only um, conduct the research, but then to see it through to completion with, with analysis and so on um, thereon. And that's pretty much it from me. I mean, again, I'm more than happy to sort of offer further reflections and very keen to engage with um, comments of, of, of further inquiries um, from those of you uh, with us, um, but also keen to hear um, from from uh, other other perspectives uh, and certainly very keen to hear from, from the donor perspective as well. So I think with that, um, Lauren and Sean, unless you're jumping back in, I think I can hand over to Harvey from UNICEF. Great, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, good afternoon, good morning, uh, wherever you may be. Um, I'm Peter Harvey from UNICEF. Uh, I, I should just point out that I, I was sort of drafted in at the last minute because uh, Peter Mace, who's our Chief of Washington ERC, um, is dealing with uh, the volcanic eruption in Goma right now, so um, he should have been here. But um, I'm happy to happy to join you. And um, so this section will build on what we've heard so far today, which is mainly focused on what humanitarians and academic partners can do to strengthen researching humanitarian crises. Um, but donors donors clearly um, have a role to play too. Um, listening to many of the challenges and the barriers that that were mentioned earlier on, they they certainly resonate with me. And some of those can be overcome by uh, research organisations and humanitarian organisations, but but actually there's quite a few of them which um, can only really be addressed holistically um, by those who are funding the research, so the donors themselves. Next slide, please. 
Um, so just to start off the discussion, I'd, I'd like you to post in the chat box um, your responses to, to this question. So what can donors do to improve how research in humanitarian crisis is funded? Um, so, so any suggestions, um, you can be as, as ambitious or off the wall as you like um, for this particular part. So as, as I um, talk through the next couple of slides, um, feel free to yeah, please type your suggestions um, into the chat box and then Lauren will, will uh, sort of synthesize those at the end. Next slide, please. Um, so we've um, looking at what what the feedback that we've got in terms of some of the issues that donors could address. Um, one of the issues that came up was was looking at funding part of the operation or the intervention cost. Now this is particularly relevant where you're testing out a new intervention, so a new uh, implementation methodology or, or an innovation um, that's been tested in the field that it could be um, add a lot of value that to to de-risk um, the costs of the humanitarian organization that the donor could actually part uh, cover part of that cost um, the second issue that came out was looking at allowing for flexible study site selection um, obviously humanitarian situ situations are often unpredictable um, and changes can occur. So if we really want, but actually we do need research in some of the more acute uh, emergency situations. So if we want to encourage that, then we need to have some flexibility. Um, otherwise, you know, implementers or researchers will tend to opt for the, for the easier sites, which um, are not necessarily those that will give us the most useful information. Um, I, I just, in looking at this, I, rec I was rec recollecting um, Many years ago, I, I managed a research project on emergency sanitation, and we had the luxury then of a multi-year um, large-scale funding from um, DFID, as it was then. Um, and I, the sites that were put in the proposal were completely different to the final sites and um, where we actually conducted the research. So I think that's a good example of where the donor had flexibility and, and sort of left it to the researcher to yeah, to to use their judgment at that at particular point when they needed to make that call. Next slide, please. Um, so what can donors do to improve in terms of their submission requirements? Um, we heard earlier on that sometimes the proposal templates um, don't have su sufficient space to put in um, the, the level of detail that's needed for a detailed methodology, for example. Um, so it's important that they're designed Yes, we want something to be succinct for reviewers to review, but it also needs to be comprehensive enough to um, make sure that there can be um, enough information within the research proposal. The governance um, issue also came up and in terms of regular communication throughout the projects. Um, I think this is really important. We've seen, uh, I've been involved in some cases where actually you wait too late and the research has gone um, beyond a particular point where you can't really go back and, and yet some of the key expectations of the donor were not were not met or or some changes were made which um which they were not you know they were not in agreement with so i think that that regular communication and, and a clear governance is, is is an important aspect next please um and then looking at the research team themselves um I know that some funders uh, insist on partnerships with institutions in uh, low-income countries or the countries where the research is actually taking place, and I think that's a very positive step. Um, but in order to do that, we need to donors also need to allow flexibility for the research team um, in terms of their background and expertise. Um, also, the, also in terms of as mentioned here, particularly about um, early career researchers, I think it's often the the younger and more adventurous among us who are, are more willing to research in contexts that some of the rest of us may may not choose to do, um, which is a really added value that, um, that yeah, we can bring different expertise and, and actually get a blend of, of different expertise. Um, an important aspect linked to that, research institutions um, in low and middle income countries, um, this is actually a great opportunity or research projects, it's going to be a great opportunity for, for them to develop their own capacity. Um, and so partnerships between institutions across the North and South um, can actually add a lot of benefit, but of course donors need to work work that into 
um, the funding mechanisms and 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 allow yeah, allow room for that um, capacity building aspect. Next, please. Um, and then yes, I think this this is a really important one that uh, Lauren mentioned earlier on in terms of the you know we we often have a bias towards health. I know UNICEF did a review of WASH evidence some years ago, and there was a clear bias um, in terms of health related research. Um, there was a clear bias in topics such as uh, water treatment and hand washing with soap, where it was much easier to design um, studies which which could be directly linked to health out, health outcomes. Um, so yeah, we need to really make sure that donors can look at different outcomes. I would argue that in some cases, social outcomes are actually more important to the people affected by crisis, depending on the context. Um, so that, that's key, but also as, as Lauren also mentioned on looking at multi outcomes, mixed methods of qualitative and quantitative um, is, is also an important flexibility that donors need to build in. And then the last point that came out was that reviewers should have some subject knowledge of WASH or WASH behaviors um, where appropriate. And so that's probably in in most cases. In fact, I would, uh, I would go slightly further that in some cases, also reviewers should have some understanding of the humanitarian um, context as well, um, not just yeah, not just the WASH one. So I think I'll finish there. And Lauren, I don't know if you want to come in with um, contributions from participants. Or is that someone else that's doing that? I'm not sure. Lauren, are you are you there? If not, I can uh, I can jump in. That's fine. Um, so we do have some really interesting, uh, and I'll just activate my video as well so that you can see me as I'm speaking. Um, so we do have some feedback that's come in uh, from uh, people as as you've been speaking, Brian. I, I think a lot of those points have uh, resonated. Um, so we've had some feedback that it would be really useful if donors spoke more to each other to align funding calls. Um, we've had um, you know some points also from Kit about making research agendas more aligned and consultative um, with, with a whole range of humanitarian partners. Um, and I think, you know, perhaps in, re in relation to those points, uh, hopefully the, the WASH in crises research agenda that Lauren briefly mentioned earlier um, can address some of those points or at least contribute towards them. Uh, we also had some feedback in the chat about the value of having sort of phased research proposals, whether there is kind of a process of negotiation uh, with the applicant and the donor. Um, uh, because I think, uh, as the person recognizes here, that sometimes the um, the concept uh, fails at the first hurdle, whereas actually, you know, with a bit more discussion, um, a, a strong idea could be developed from an initial proposal. Um, so, so I think those are some of the points that emerged. We now do want to um, open up a Slido. So if, if we could uh, bring that back up onto the, the screen. Um, so again, you're going back to sli.do and using the passcode hashtag EEHF. Um, and there you'll find a question about um, what would be the one thing that donors could do to help organizations strengthen research funding applications and implementing these in crises. So really, again, this is a, a process of trying to um, elucidate where we should prioritize our focus. Oh, sorry, uh, and, and I, I uh, need to clarify that I gave you the wrong code. Uh, the code is 6037444. So if you type that, type that in instead of the EHF one. So as we um, await uh, for responses there, uh, we welcome additional comments in the chat. And tech team, I will just uh, swap over in a moment so that you can see the results on my screen. So if we can stop sharing the slides, that would be great.
Okay, so I do see results coming in here. At the moment, um, we can see we have quite a lot of votes for um, focusing on a range of uh, health and, and behavioral and social outcomes. We can see that it would be really useful to perhaps cover some of those operational costs um, and interventional costs, uh, since it's very hard to get those things to align nicely. Um, quite a few votes coming in for that. Um, and some people also saying that a bit more flexibility in the research team to support early career researchers is likely to be key and also to support researchers from low and middle income country contexts. Um, and having a bit more budget and time to develop research capacity within staff and perhaps including that in, in, in proposals. Um, so great, it's great to see these changing in, in real time. And I, I think, you know, there is agreement that having this coordinated strategy and, and getting donors to speak more to each other would be of real value. Great, so we'll continue to have some of those results coming in. Uh, thanks very much everyone for, for voting. Um, and uh, Lauren, I'll hand back over to you. Great, thanks. Thanks, Sharon, for that. Um, so as these, uh, as the voting keeps coming in and, and picking what one thing uh, donors could do to help this easier, we wanted to kind of give some space and time Time to any emergent questions that you have had from from today, um, you know, you know, how to improve research proposals. You know, looking back at the common pitfalls and and perhaps study designs, and really just kind of create that discussion space um, for us here together. Whilst we're kind of collating some of those results coming in um, to the window. So I'm going to open um, the floor, kind of seeing any comments that can come in from the group. Um, and just yeah again i guess we again just to plug actually uh, the wash research agenda exercise that we will be conducting um you know so this is in collaboration with the wash cluster it's been funded by aura so um lshdm tufts and and aura and the global wash cluster will be conducting this um as a collaboration and we'll be doing consultations of you know agencies and academics and donors and all the different networks of people who work in washing crises research and um, with it with the aim to have this consensus this this strategy in the wash sector um, to really push research forward and kind of align ourselves and, and speak to different donors. You know, I think some of you or many of you actually on this call would have been part of the cholera research agenda that just um, concluded uh, late last year and you know already we can see that there's been kind of action and traction with different um, funding agencies, different organisations kind of harnessing their energy to focus on specific questions that they had from that agenda exercise. So I think it's going to be a really great exercise for us coming up in the sector and kind of all moving and, and moving forward in the same direction. So I'm going to hand back to Sean um, to read the Slido results um, just in case my connection falters one more time. Um, over to you Sean, thank you very much. Thanks, Lauren. So um, I, th I think our results are, are in, and it does seem like there is a large majority um, centered around this first one here, which is is the funding of operational and interventional costs. And I, I think that speaks to a lot of the uh, the points that came up earlier in today's session about aligning timelines and making sure interventions are delivered well. And, and I think if that's aligned under one project, we, we give things a much better chance from the offset. Um, but it is interesting that we, we clearly have um, a lot of other uh, challenges within donor funding arrangements that possibly should be addressed as well. Um, so I, I think a focus on, on more involvement of, of lower level researchers and um, low and middle income institutions, um, those, those range of, of indicators um, and reviewers having strong um, subject knowledge in WASH and humanitarian sectors um, and also uh, appropriate kind of government uh, governance systems and communications within projects. Uh, lastly, um, to a lesser extent, um, the budget and time to develop uh, capacity within staff and coordination across actors also emerge. Um, great, so we'll, um, we'll end uh, that slide over there. Um, and we would like to thank all of you for, for joining today. Uh, we hope that today's session is kind of um, the start of a discussion rather than the end of it. Um, and that some of the reflections that you've shared um, in, in the chat today, uh, you can perhaps follow up and have those internal discussions within your organizations and continue to do so between each other. Uh, so thanks a lot to everyone um, and uh, thanks also uh, for, for joining the EHF throughout the week. Um, I think Lauren you've got some, some housekeeping around EHF to share.
Yes, I do. Um, so one, of course, because we are, you know, in the spirit of the EHF and in the spirit of research and evaluation, we do have a survey for, for you to complete and um, for the EHF to tell us how it went and um, how you found the week. I've put that into the chat now. So it'd be really great. Um, this is our first virtual event. Uh, it comes with, you know, all of the the, the issues and the, the challenges that that faces. But, you know, we did have incredible reach of this week. And just looking at the numbers alone from this week, we had roughly 180 people attending each day. And considering we usually have between 100 to 150 in, in a room face to face, um, the fact that we have that global reach and people are able to attend for, for part of the session all of the day and from their respective locations has been really fantastic outside. But of course, um, as the audience, we want to hear more from you on how this has gone so really asking for for you to fill in that very short i promise you it's very short um evaluation form uh to be completed i've just put that in the chat so again massive thank you and thank you for bearing with us this week and for all of the fantastic presenters and fantastic questions we've had across this week uh, we could not do the ehf without you so thank you very much to all of you too and um, that's all for me and um, have a good rest of your friday everybody thank you